Thank you very much, Mr. Stocker. Well, I can't tell you how happy I am to have been invited to Ars Electronica. Ever since the 1990s, I've been following events at this festival, and I have always been thinking, now I have to go there one day. Now I've been, I've been invited as a speaker. What uh, else could I wish for? So thank you very much. Uh, the opening event has been so inspiring, I've seen excellent exhibits. So what is my presentation all about? Uh, we are not uh, uh, mind readers. We don't hold the world record in mind reading, but we uh, try to find out how modern brain research can be used to find out what a person is thinking and what that person is about to do. Of course, that opens the door to science fiction, and therefore, I'd like to put the question today. Uh, in science fiction, we hear about mind-reading machines. Now, what is or what can be true about that? Uh, uh, let me start with something extremely speculative. Uh, Ray Kurzweil in the description of his speculations in 2005 coined the term of singularity and he applied it uh, to brain research and cybernetics and his basic idea was that that by 2045, computers and digital technology would allow us to overcome our biological existence and simulate our mind in the computer, download it into the computer, which means that we would no longer be finite. And that is the question. Can we really hope that by 2045, uh, we will be able to download our minds uh, to a computer? And how could we do that? To simplify things, let's take the following as a starting point. Thoughts are stored in our brain, like music on a CD. On a CD, it's the grooves um, with zeros and ones coding the music. And in analogy to that, our brain codes our thoughts by firing nerve cells. There are certain uh, patterns of activity that can be translated into thoughts a person is having in his or her brain. So a certain pattern of activity in a person's brain could be translated into a childhood experience, as shown on the right. Brain research today, unlike uh, what it was in the 1980s, assumes that thoughts are coded on a one-to-one -one basis in one's brain. There is no Nothing superfluous happening there, like Descartes and also Popper and Eccles might have thought. The brain is the sole carrier of our thoughts, and when we die, our thoughts are lost and our mental existence ceases. That is the position taken by the majority of brain researchers. There are other researchers present in the room who may perhaps contribute other hypotheses, but I think that is a basic consensus. Uh, as the biological brain comes to an end, uh, the thoughts cease and end. Now, let me show you a science fiction movie. In the 1970s, uh, uh, this was about a mind-reading machine, a hypothetical mind-reading machine that would allow you to uh, trace a person's ideas on a video wall. For me, this is the best ever representation of a scientific mind-reading machine. Part of future world. The idea is to actually make a videotape of a dream. You take it with you, play it back, find out what you're thinking about. That is absolutely incredible. You want to try it? Go ahead, Sox. Go for it. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. You know, maybe 
I could use it on the program. I think you'll find us a unique experience. Talk to you this way. You here. bet. I gotta see this. Wait a minute. You mean he can watch? Unless you object. Well, I don't know whether I do or not. I mean, it depends on what I dream, doesn't it? Well, don't you worry about it. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> All right, wise guy. It's about time you learned something about women. This way. Ooh. Are you sure I won't have a nightmare? I mean, this thing looks pretty frightening. Oh, well, we'll see to it if that doesn't happen. The couch is designed to remove any pressure along the neural spinal column. And the material bleeds air at the exact temperature of your body. So you'll see nothing, feel nothing, hear nothing. Your mind will begin to feed on itself. Hmm, with my luck, I won't be able to fall asleep. Bye. Every thought, like every eye blink or a heartbeat, releases currents of electricity, which can be transformed into waves. She's got a lot on her mind, huh? Well, we're recording 2,000 different waves from 5,000 separate brain locations. Wow. Millions of bits of information. We take it all in and put it back together on this. What's this? Take a look. What you see? I can't believe it. No, it's true. You're looking directly into her mind. We've learned how to convert thought waves back into the images the mind creates. It isn't perfect, of course. It'll do. Wow. Activate the pain pleasure gradient, please. Who's that? Reverence, a fantasy lover. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Okay, also wir sehen, wenn man aus... So, you have to be careful when reading out a person's brain. It can be embarrassing for either side, and the issue of stimulation comes up. Uh, that was the film Future World from the 1970s. So, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what can we do today with modern brain scanners. They measure uh, brain activity, not brain waves, but uh, the blood oxygen content that is being analyzed. And this is where the big secret comes in, because on the basis of the brain measurements, we can reconstruct uh, the thoughts of a person remembering her ninth birthday, for example, and that takes us to the issue of memory. Uh, these days, we use magnetic uh, resonance imaging. The basic idea is that the magnetic uh, content of blood is being measured, which tells you whether uh, the blood has bound oxygen or not. When the nerve cells become active, they uh, produce oxygen and a cascade of uh, um, events takes place and the degree of magnetization of the blood changes. When the test subject uh, subjects are moved into the tube, camera teams would like to film that, but they can't get in with their camera and all they can film is the feet of the test subject, which is quite boring. So this is a cross section showing how the test subject is lying in the tube. Um, he's got earphones for instructions. He can speak, he can communicate, he can press buttons, and we can um, investigate. Well, we, we give the test subject simple video games to perform uh, to test his visual memory, his ability to plan ahead, etc. Using the MRI, we take brain scans. Uh, those are not simple uh, pictures, not simple images of the brain. Statistics uh, plays an important role here. The 
evaluation or interpretation procedures are highly complicated. We have to interpret a multitude of data, and this is what we do at the Bernstein Center of the Charité Hospital in Berlin. And what we get is images like this. This is the brain activity of a test subject looking at a visual object. Now, how are our thoughts coded in our brain? It's not as simple as that. It's not that, uh, like saying, well, when I think of a dog or when I think of a cat, uh, different parts of the brain are activated. The um, um, brain codes our uh, thoughts in a much more difficult, uh, uh, complicated way. Parts of the cortex are responsible for seeing, hearing, uh, uh, smelling, etc. Normally, a memory and an experience are made up of different regions of the brain. Let's take a simple variant. Uh, experiencing visual images. So you can reduce that and zoom into the visual brain region. What you can see here are sections of the temporal load of the human brain, four objects. Uh, the test subjects are looking at, and what we can see on the right, uh, shown in different colors, are the different regions which are particularly active. Uh, in warm colors, the regions that are very active. In cold colors, those that are less active. When we think of a face of a house, a, a shoe, a bench, uh, uh, it's not a single region of the brain that is being activated. It's a distributed pattern of activities. So we have to interpret brain activity as a whole. It's not enough to look at a single spot. And that's important to remember. Uh, uh, using the MRI equipment, you can't examine individual nerve cells, but the advantage is that the spatial coding patterns can be studied very well. In order to evaluate these spatial patterns, we use software, which you can see on television in crime scene investigation, but we adapted to our own purposes. It's software quite similar to the one used for fingerprint recognition. It's pattern recognition. We feed examples of brain activity um, for these four activities into the computer. So we tell the computer, look, this is what the brain activity looks like, the pattern looks like when the test subject is thinking of a face or looking at a face. And the computer learns to uh, allocate those, there are businesses in the market that claim they can build reliable lie detectors on the basis of MRI. But the question is, how do we know that it really works? How do we know that somebody's claim that he can decode something on the basis of brain activity is actually correct? Now, let's, look, let's take a new example. Let a person think of one of those four things. We don't know which one. And uh, you can guess, this is a new data set, you can guess what the person is thinking of. Any idea? Yes, it's the chair. You did exactly what the computer would be doing. You made a visual comparison. You compared the image on the right with the examples on the left, and you chose the one which is the most similar. It's correct. It was the chair. It works with simple scenarios. Our system is well adapted to to pattern recognition. But if we had hundreds of examples, and if we had a lot of noise in those data, it would be much more difficult to recognize a similarity. But that is the simple system. Uh, the computer is trained in these patterns, and the patterns the computer has learned uh, 
it will also recognize. This, I'll show you an example um, from my colleague, Jake, Jack Gallet, who decoded video sequences on the basis of brain activities. And for that, he needed to understand how the brain codes activity. This is an example of the computer learning on the basis of statistical procedures, uh, procedures of allocation, which image belongs to which brain activity. For the next example, you need much more understanding of the situation. This is uh, from Nishimoto and Gallant, Steve Martin on the left and on the right, the reconstruction. It was an arbitrary image from a video sequence, and you yourself uh, can decide, is it particularly impressive? Is it no good at all? Is the glass half full or half empty? I think it's impressive that Merely on the basis of brain activity, the image on the right can be reconstructed. I'll show you a video of uh, made by this uh, colleague of ours, which shows up the limits uh, to our potential for reconstruction. This is not science fiction. So the algorithm can understand more or less what's being uh, represented, but the resolution of present-day MRI machines is just not enough to give you any more details. I just showed you a video uh, from Future World, and what was being decoded there were not the ideas of a person awake, but of a person dreaming, that is, memories. And this year, colleagues from Japan for the first time, we're able to show that dreams can be decoded from brain activity. Now, how does that work? It can't be done during REM sleep. That would be the natural dream phase, but it's too difficult for the experiment. So it can only be done during sleep phase one when you're just nodding off. So. A person were just about to fall asleep, uh, then they were woken up again, and they were asked what had they been seeing, and then um, this was reconstructed on the basis of brain activity. You don't get videos as a result. Uh, simple categories like a human being, a tool, but not complex visual image sequences, but nevertheless, to a certain degree, you can reconstruct something a person is experiencing while dreaming. So does that mean that we have a mind reading machine in the form of MRI in combination with pattern recognition? The answer, it, it is a simple form of mind reading machine, a very simple form. But there are limits to this technology. I'll show you some of them. One important limit is that of resolution. The image points we can measure have a resolution of a few millimeters, and that means up to one million nerve cells. So if we want to read uh, the details of a person's thought, we would need a technology that does not measure the blood ox oxygen content. We would need something that allows us to measure the activity of individual nerve cells. And that, as you can imagine, is extremely difficult, and it's made even more difficult by the fact that a human being has 86 billion nerve cells, and measuring them all at the same time is extremely difficult. We don't even know which technology we could use uh, for a simultaneous measurement of all nerve cells. So as regards application, what kinds of applications are conceivable? Ars Electronica in the past has often had EEC installations. One of my favorites is that installation worth 
from Japan with um, ears that simulate a person's emotions. An excellent example. But what could we do in our everyday lives? Certainly not using an MRI equipment because an MRI machine weighs 15 tons. You can't carry that on your head. So if we want mobile technologies, we would have to use EEC. That's going to be uh, the method of the future. It doesn't produce as many artifacts as we used to think in the past. When somebody is wearing a mobile EEC, um, infrared spectroscopy uh, is another procedure but it has many disadvantages, so that's not very useful. What other limits are there? What other difficulties are there? One of the difficulties is that we don't know much about how patterns in the brain are exposed to plasticity. Now, I had certain ideas about Linz before coming here, and then I have the experience of Linz, and my uh, perceptions have changed. And when you've measured the activity patterns a person had as a child watching his favorite movie, um, having his favorite meal, as a child, and 50 years later, as a professor emeritus, the person's interests may have changed. And the question is, have the activity patterns changed? I certainly think so. But how can we understand the system behind those changes? We don't know. Another problem. Activity patterns coding certain contents differ from individual to individual. You can't really replicate brains because brains are individual and you can't replicate nerve cells. There is a certain amount of self-organization in pattern formation. In a leopard, uh, you can't, uh, each leopard is different, the spots are different, and in the brain, the patterns are different. There are patterns, but they differ from individual to individual, and this makes things particularly difficult. You can't build a piece of equipment, put a person into an MRI machine, and read that person's mind. First, you need to understand how thoughts are coded in that particular person's brain activity. One of the biggest problems we have is that we can think of so many different things. This is the Oxford English Dictionary, and uh, uh, the wealth of ideas we can have is just as comprehensive. So you might say that all you need to know is the activity patterns that go hand in hand with certain thought activities. And in a project that's entitled, read the dictionary to me. Um, you start out doing that, and perhaps after 500 years, you've got to the letter G, and uh, gather it. So it takes a while to measure the whole dictionary. So we need to find a way of doing this without uh, uh, measuring each and every relation between a thought and a an activity pattern. There is some hope, though. This is a thought experiment. <laughs> Those are not real data. On the right, at the top, the activity pattern of someone thinking of a car. Uh, bottom right, someone thinking of a bicycle. Now you've got that in your database, but you measure uh, the activity pattern in the middle. You've never seen that before, but it's a bit like that of the car and a bit like the activity pattern of the bicycle. So what could it be? Excellent. Excellent answer from someone in the first row, a motorbike. Brain activity patterns that code uh, thoughts behave that way. Similarities 
um, in concepts, uh, notions, and identities are uh, represented in a similar manner. So we will not be able to build the perfect mind-reading machine, but we can read simple thoughts. Um, which is much more than we thought we could ever do uh, 10 or 15 years ago. But let's go back to science fiction. So it's not just about reading a person's mind. When you look at science fiction movies, some uh, are shown here, Total Recall, looks like an MRI machine. That's what one thought it would be like in 1990. Um, bottom right, uh, logging into uh, a virtual reality and uh, establishing a connection between the brain on the computer, matrix um, uh, on the left, looks quite invasive, um, a metal bar inserted into the brain, and then Welt am Draht, a, a movie by uh, Fassbinder. Um, that, those were the ideas uh, in science fiction films. So um, in these movies, it's not just about reading uh, thoughts, but about uh, establishing a coupling between the computer and the brain. Uh, the computer gets something out of your brain and inputs something into the brain, a virtual re reality. And that is the second question. How do we upload things into the brain? Uh, this is from Strange Days, a film from 1995. There are so-called squids, a one under a wig, and recording the brain activity on a disc, recording what that person is experienced. But you can give that disc to another person. A person wears the same disc under a wig on his or her head and can uh, have the same experience. So you don't only record thoughts, but you can also play back those thoughts. And of course, that's even more difficult in terms of technology. The activity patterns in the brain that code certain thoughts um, cover very large brain areas, the visual system, the uh, auditory system, um, the sense of smell. And within these brain areas, the activities are finely coded. Uh, you need to inscribe a certain pattern of activity to generate a thought. And the only technique, non-invasive technique we have to stimulate the brain is a transcranial magnet or electrostimulation. It's like a, a hammer and a hammer blow on your head. And the specificity is about the same. So you can imagine, uh, you, can, you may wonder if you can really inscribe such fine patterns in a person's brain. Because you need to stimulate the brain all over, and we wouldn't even know how to do that, technically speaking. There is another interesting fiction in this science fiction movie. That is the manipulation of thought contents. Using psychological tricks, of course, you can do that. But in uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, the idea is that you can manipulate thought contents or extinguish thoughts. And now I'll show you uh, a video from Total Recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger on the under, traveling on the underground learns about a technique um, of a mind implant that allows him to go on holiday when he can't do so in reality.
Then come to Recall Incorporated, where you can buy the memory of your ideal vacation cheaper, safer, and better than the real thing. So don't let life pass you by. Call Recall for the memory of a lifetime. So, and as I'm interested, but also... Well, of course he's interested, but he's also skeptical, because one of the big questions... As real as any memory in your head. Come on, don't bullshit me. No, I'm telling you, Doug, your brain will not know the difference. And that's guaranteed, or your money back. What about the guy you lobotomized? Did he get a refund? Okay, also es können auch Dinge schief gehen und naturgemäß... Well, things may go wrong, and things do go wrong. Fortunately, it hasn't happened to us yet, but manipulation of thought content is something that's not being done on real test subjects, but it is going wrong in the movie. And we can ask ourselves, how would we do that? The idea is not to simulate a person into a virtual reality. It's two things, the brain implant and coupling somebody into a reality. But how can you implant a memory uh, so that the person remembers something he or she has never done? Uh, the temporal uh, median temporal regions play a particularly important role, the hippocampus. And at least in mice, you can take an influence on certain learning processes and uh, switch on traces of memory or switch them off. Uh, so far, this can only be done in a single brain region in the hippocampus. But our memories, like our primary experiences, are spread out over the entire brain. So the hippocampus is important for saving memories and thoughts, but our thoughts are spread out over the entire brain. We call it reinstantiation. The brain um, is brought back into the state in which it had the original experience. When you see a certain situation of painting by Picasso for the first time, or when you imagine that with your eyes closed, or when you remember that on the basis of your long-term memory, so your whole brain will be active uh, in such uh, an instance. Now, brain implants are difficult to do because we would have to reprogram the whole brain. In Total Recall, another interesting question comes up. After an accident, he seems to live in a virtual reality, and the borderline between simulation and reality becomes blurred, and the following happens. It calls for you to accept, Mr. Quaid. I'm listening. I'm afraid you're not really standing here right now. You know, Doug, you could have fooled me. I'm quite serious. You're not here, and neither am I. That's amazing. <laughs> Where are we? At recall. You're strapped into an implant chair, and I'm monitoring you from the psychoprobe console. Okay, also, um, that's... That is a question we've all put to ourselves when we've seen films like Matrix or Welt am Draht. What if everything around us were pure simulation? That's an idea that dates back very long. Uh, philosophers have put the question, what if our brain were in a tank, in a nutrient solution, all inputs and outputs are computer simulated, and if the world around us did not exist or were uh, being simulated by a computer? That is a question of interest for philosophers in the first place, but the big question is, how do we know that we're not living in a simulation? We can put questions to the simulation that either convince us that the simulation is a simulation or reality. And there's another important, interesting part of the movie. And I could pull this trigger and it won't matter. 
Yes. 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 If somebody were to say this is a simulation, uh, you might uh, pull the trigger of that gun. It's not a very useful uh, way of doing it uh, in our everyday lives. Uh, but in our brain, we have certain mechanisms that monitor whether we believe that uh, uh, the world around us is real or a simulation. And uh, we have the uncanny valley phenomenon that is simulated objects that look almost real, but not really real. And they are uncanny, more so than when we look at objects that are quite different. And that's to do with regions in the brain that relate to memories and fear. You can register that to a certain extent. and. Arnold Schwarzenegger in that movie does register it. He realizes that it is not a simulation. Well, he couldn't believe that one would be able to simulate perspiration. So, if we wanted uh, to create such a reality, we would have to be able to record, to stimulate, to create a virtual world that looks authentic. And there are two more things we need to bear in mind. We have to consider the body, the idea uh, that our thoughts are coded in the brain is correct, but it may well be that our complete mental space can only be reproduced correctly if we include the body. So the body may have to be included in a simulation. This is the pianist Joachim Kuhn, one of the musicians uh, I don't know if you've ever seen him live. Uh, he uses his whole body when playing the piano. And the body plays an important role, not just for dance, but also for music. And we try to follow that up with a project which we did together with Mr. Fritz who has just um, had an article published in a renowned scientific journal. So it's the idea of including the body in our authentic uh, experience, creating coherence between the body and an emotional experience. So the idea is uh, uh, using a musical fitness machine to establish that congruence between physical input, physical arousal, and emotional arousal, involving the physical level in such simulation is extremely important. And this tells us that it's not enough to look into the brain. We might also have to scan the body. And one of the most difficult problems, difficult also for philosophers, let's assume that uh, uh, the brain has been downloaded, as Mr. Kurzweil was suggesting. Um, we've made a couple of backups just in case something goes wrong. Now, it's all been downloaded on a computer, Tian He 2, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Now, what is the problem? How can we know that this simulation of my mind has experiences at all? 
uh, it might be that the simulation of the mind has as many or as few experiences as the as a black hole has gravity and it's called the zombie problem in philosophy it might be that there is something that looks like a human being behaves like a human being speaks like a human being but nevertheless it's as automatic as a computer simulation and that is a question of principle which uh, uh, is leads us uh, to a question of faith of belief do we believe that uh, a complete simulation of a human being in a computer is possible or not and that is a question which science probably will never be able to answer